Well, today is the last message of our series, Last Words. This is, as we've been looking at the last words of Jesus from the cross over these last few weeks. Um, you know, he made seven statements from the cross that we have recorded in the Gospels. He may have said other things, but we have seven that are recorded. And uh, he said three of the statements at the very beginning of his time on the cross and four of the statements in succession right at the very end of his time on the cross, moments before he died. And we've been looking at, at Jesus' last words and the power that last words hold, as well as other people throughout history and the last words that they spoke and, and, and the meaning that they hold as well. There's a guy I'm going to tell you about this morning. Um, he was born in the 1620s. I know y'all are all fresh on your history from the 1600s uh, this morning. You're, I know you... Uh, you all are, are good friends with Bob Ward, the history teacher, and so you all know everything about history. But in the 1620s, there was a French soldier uh, by the name of Nicholas Herman. And he was serving in the military in France, and he came across this barren tree. And he was overwhelmed in that moment by the greatness of God's plan in having the tree go dormant. And then in just a few weeks' time, when spring struck, it would blossom and bloom and bud and it would grow to great strength and he was just overcome with emotion just observing that tree and knowing God's plan well uh, Nicholas Herman eventually left the army and uh, he went and joined a monastery in Paris remember he was a French soldier he was French so he went and joined this monastery in Paris and he took a new name while he was at this monastery his name was Lawrence of the Resurrection they called him Brother Lawrence. And uh, serving there, he, he had very little education, and he had no formal training. So the guys at the monastery gave him the jobs nobody else wanted. So he started as the kitchen floor cleaner, and he eventually worked his way all the way up to sandal repairer. He was doing the jobs there in the monastery that nobody else wanted to do, and they gave it to him for that reason. But he began to gain a reputation because of the, the love and grace and joy he displayed doing these menial tasks. He, he did them every day, not just because it was his responsibility, not just because it was his job for that day. He did it because he felt it was the Lord's assignment for him. So even if it was scrubbing the grease off the kitchen floor, even if it was repairing a guy's sandals that were not all that clean, he saw it as an opportunity to serve God through what he was doing. And because everyone observed the joy with which he did his job, the reputation that he gained was one of who was a, 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 an individual especially close to God. Well, Brother Lawrence wrote a lot of great material. He wrote a lot of uh, uh, Christian D discipleship manuals and devotion of how we should live our lives. And he wrote a bunch of letters to a bunch of people trying to encourage them in their Christian walk. And just a few days before he died, his last letter ended this way. I hope for the merciful grace of seeing the Lord in a few, in a few days. His hope was just to see the Lord in just a couple of days. And he lived his life in that fashion in that way and Jesus dying on the cross knew he was going to see God in a mere moments as he spoke to that other thief on the cross today you will be with me in paradise but the last words that he spoke there from the cross are also very interesting which is what today is the seventh statement from the cross the very last thing he said before he died you know we looked at a couple weeks ago Jesus said, I'm thirsty. They gave him something to drink. After that, he said, it is finished. The work he came to do, the, the work to bring about salvation was done. And then he said one final thing. We're going to be in Luke chapter 23. Luke 23. It's on page 884 if you're using the Bible there on the pew rack in front of you. Luke chapter 23, starting in verse 44. This is what Luke wrote. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Now they judged time based upon when the sun came up, give or take. So the sixth hour was about noon, and the ninth hour was about three o'clock in the afternoon. So it was dark from noon to three. 
completely dark. Verse 45, while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. This is interesting. Another one of the Gospels tells us that the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, this is the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. And the Holy of Holies was where the Ark of the Covenant was. The Ark of the Covenant, before Indiana Jones found it, this is where it was. It was in the Holy of Holies. It had the Ten Commandments in it, and it represented God's presence. And only one day a year, one person was allowed to enter the Holy of Holies. That's the way they operated. And then this curtain that separated that place that represented God's presence with the rest of the people, that curtain was torn into from top to bottom. First off, that curtain was immensely thick. Somebody couldn't just walk up to it and and rip it with their hands. Secondly, it was dozens of feet into the air. No one could go up there and tear it in that fashion. To be torn in two from top to bottom, there was only one way it could have happened. God did it. And at the moment of Jesus' death, that curtain was torn in two, giving a representation to all of us. God's presence is accessible for everyone who believes in Jesus, his death and resurrection. And so that's what Luke is writing here. The curtain was torn in two. Verse 46. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having breathed this, or having said this, he breathed his last. Now Jesus from the cross has quoted several passages of scripture. This is another one. This is Psalm 31, verse 5. Into your hands I commit my spirit. But what is really fascinating is that the phrase we looked at last week, it is finished, he called out with a loud voice. Here in verse 46, he calls out again with a loud voice. And he, remember, he just had something to drink, so that you know, uh, lubricated his throat and his tongue, helping him speak. But what's so interesting is that normally when people who were crucified died, they died silently, gasping for breath. Because they, did, they were unable to breathe and they were exhausted. And so none of them were able to talk. That just didn't happen. That wasn't normal. Well, if there's anything we know about Jesus, it's that he's not normal. He yelled this out. And then it says he breathed his last. But Jesus spoke about this moment when he was teaching. In John chapter 10, Jesus said, for this reason... The Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. So Jesus says, no one's going to take my life from me. I'm going to give it. I'm giving it. So when it says he breathed his last, he willingly gave up his spirit for our own salvation. Dying on the cross, he gave it up on purpose, on God's plan. Into your hands, I commit my spirit. That statement, I commit my spirit, that commitment of his spirit, uh, that is a statement of great trust, of great faith in the Lord and his plan. And faith is the foundation upon which all of us are supposed to go about our days based on faith, on trust in the Lord. And all throughout scripture, we, we see people walking around in great faith. We see Abraham, we see uh, Isaac, uh, we see Joseph, we see Moses, we see David, we see Daniel. New Testament, I mean Jesus on the cross, we see in the book of Acts, we see Paul walking around in great faith. Faith was the basis of their lives. Faith is what drove these people every single day. Paul, particularly, we're going to look at in the book of Acts, demonstrating great faith. He was challenged everywhere he went, a price on his head, every city he walked into. People trying to undermine him, people trying to betray him, people stoning him at one point, beating him. He's getting whipped, arrested. Well, eventually he does get arrested in a very terrible way in the middle of a mob uh, at the temple. He's arrested And he eventually is taken before uh, this particular uh, government official, this Roman government official. 
And in the middle of that conversation with this government official, Paul exercises the right of every Roman citizen. You see, every Roman citizen, when they're taken to court, has the opportunity to appeal to Caesar, to have his case or her case taken before Caesar, and then Caesar would hear their case. That was a huge risk, though. Because if Caesar woke up in a bad mood or had some bad grits for breakfast, then you're probably going to die because Caesar didn't have much grace. He didn't have much mercy. And so it's a huge risk to say, I appeal to Caesar. And what's so great, what's so interesting though and great is in Paul's case, his case in court would have been tossed out because there was really no grounds for it. But he had already been told by God, you need to get before Caesar and tell him the gospel. So Paul appealed to Caesar. Because for him, the gospel was more important even than his freedom, than his rights. And so he appeals to Caesar. And so they take him by boat towards Rome. And when he's on this boat, problems begin to arise, which is where we're going to look. In Acts chapter 27, starting down in verse 14. Luke, who we just read, Jesus' words, into your hands I commit my spirit. Luke also wrote the book of Acts, and he writes this. But soon, a tempestuous wind called the Northeaster struck down from the land. Now, that word tempestuous, I know you all use that word on a daily basis, uh, but I don't. Uh, and so I, I looked up what it means uh, in the original language. It means a violent hurricane force that is extended and extremely powerful. So this hurricane force wind, violent, extended, whips down from the land. This incredible storm strikes this boat that they're on, this ship that they're on. Look at verse 15. In the ship, and when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. They could not face the wind. They could not fight against the wind any longer. You know, sometimes we feel like we can't fight any longer right? Like what we're facing is so overwhelming that we just give in to the push and pull of the storm wherever it would take us to go, wherever it would take us to go without any resistance from us because we feel like we don't have the strength within us to fight against the storm any longer. And sometimes our efforts to fight against the storm have little or no impact on the outcome of what's going on. So we just get up, give up because we're tired of fighting. We're tired of going against it. With the guys on this ship, that's what they did. They gave up because they were tired and they just knew they could not fight the storm any longer. And so the storm just began to whip them around and blow them all over the sea, wherever it would. And they just gave up fighting the storm. Uh, look down. Let's see. They're whipped around. Look down at verse 18. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. Now, I want to point out there in that verse, it says, we were violently storm-tossed. So the author of the book, Luke, is on the ship with them. Luke is there. And he says, they began to jettison the cargo. That's the, the sailors, the, the crew, began to take the cargo that they were carrying from one place to another and toss it over in hopes uh, that the ship wouldn't be weighed, weighed down as much and they would be able to regain control. And so they tossed this stuff over, verse 19. And on the third day... They threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. So they're clearing out everything they possibly could or they thought they could afford to lose in order to continue moving forward. They're just getting rid of all the stuff they think is extra. Uh, verse 20. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay on us. There's that word again that we just looked at back up in verse 14. Tempestuous wind, this is it. The tempest lay before us, the hurricane force winds, this insane storm. All hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. The storm would not let up. No matter how much they wanted it to let up, no matter how much they tried to fight against it, the storm was, was stronger than they were. And so hope fled from them. And they gave up. Because there was seemingly no end in sight. They thought they were going to be overcome by the storm. And so they abandoned hope and embraced the hopelessness. But Paul was not among the hopeless. Look at verse 21. 
Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. (laughs) Now, what Paul's about to say is phenomenal and and demonstrates great faith, but I find in this verse um, humor. (laughs) I don't know if you know anybody who, when you're in in the midst of a bad situation, stands up and says, if you would have done what I told you to do, you wouldn't be here. You know anybody like that? Maybe you're sitting next to them. Don't look at them, but <laughs> you should have listened to me. We wouldn't be here. And so Paul, it's in, remember, they're in the middle of a storm. Crazy wind, crazy rain, hurricane force. I don't know if you've ever been in the midst of a hurricane, but it's crazy. And they're out there, and they're in the middle of the sea. And Paul's screaming over the storm, I told you so. But he doesn't leave it there. Verse 22. He says, yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told but we must run aground on some island. I don't know if you caught it there, but he said it twice. He said, take heart. He told them to take heart. That literally means be encouraged and cheerful. When you find you're in the throes of the greatest battle of your life, do you experience much cheerfulness? Or do you have somebody who just says, you need to get over it? You ever know anybody like that? Paul's not telling them necessarily to get over it. He's saying, be encouraged And be cheerful, not because of what we're going through, but because God is with us. He says, take heart, be encouraged. Because that's what Paul, that's what faith does. Him demonstrating this great faith is is, he is realizing, and not only realizing, but communicating the truth of faith, that faith encourages. Faith within us encourages us. Faith encourages us no matter what we're going through. Faith encourages us because faith offers hope where there is only hopelessness. Faith encourages us to keep moving forward and follow the the, the path that the Lord has set before us. Faith encourages us. But I want to point out something there in that verse, uh, verse 25. He says, take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. It will be exactly So this faith that encourages, this trust that encourages, it also provides something else because faith is confident. Paul's offering absolute confidence in the midst of a storm when there is no physical evidence that what he is saying will come to pass. Paul has faith in the Lord, and so he knows even though the physical evidence says nothing that would reinforce these words, he's confident the Lord will deliver. He's confident the Lord will take care of it because faith is confident. He says, I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. Faith encourages. Faith is confident. But faith that encourages and faith is confident is faith that is properly placed. Sometimes we place faith in all kinds of things, a variety of things that are not the Lord. In Psalm 20, verse 7, It's written, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord, our God. A lot of times, we can put faith in things that we feel like we have control over. Like in that verse, some trust in chariots. I built my chariot. I know how it operates. I know how strong it is. I've used it in other battles. I know how strong my horse is. I have trained my horse. I know what he can do. I have faith in those things. But the name of the Lord, I can't see. I can't control the Lord. Now, we're not going to say, I mean, you're in church on Sunday morning. You're not going to say, well, I don't have faith in in the Lord. But sometimes our actions demonstrate it. When we live like we have greater faith in what we are able to accomplish than what God is able to accomplish. And so that verse is powerful. Some trust in chariots, some in horses. And honestly, I am some sometimes. But we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. 
Paul's on that ship. When those guys, they were trusting the people who built the ship. They were trusting their own skill as sailors in how to be able to control the ship. And Paul stands up and says, you can't control any of this. You can't control any of this. All that stuff you put your faith in is now useless against the storm. So put your trust in the Lord. And he will provide a way through. We need to have faith that is properly placed. And once these people, Paul was able to convince the, the, the leader of the ship, not the captain of the ship, but the captain of the troops. He was a centurion. Uh, jump down to verse 42. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest on planks or on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. You see, Paul had faith in the Lord. The centurion had faith in Paul's faith. And so essentially he trusted the Lord was going to take care of them because Paul said it was going to happen. They had rock-hard faith, faith that was built on the rock from Jesus' parable in Matthew chapter 7. Jesus said, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. In the middle of the storm, I mean, that's a storm. I don't know if you know that or not. I mean, the rains came, the floods came, but the house did not fall because of the foundation it was built upon. The faith of the one who built it. He didn't have faith in the strength of the house. He had faith in the strength of the rock. Far too often, I'll freely admit, I have faith in the strength of what I built, what I did with my own hands. When in truth, we should have faith in the rock. Because without the rock, there is no house standing. Without the rock, there's just a pile of rubble. The rock is what allows the house to stand at all. And so Paul is able to stand on that ship in the middle of the storm and say, I know that you are not strong enough to defeat the storm. I know that I am not strong enough to defeat the storm. And yet still, Paul was not hopeless. Paul had great confidence. Paul was encouraged by the faith in the Lord. Paul, Paul trusted that God was going to do whatever God was going to do, and it was going to be good because he's God. And so that's the thing. Even when you don't feel strong enough, you need to trust that he is. Even when you don't feel like you know the way out, even, like, even, even if you don't feel like you don't know why this is happening or why this experience is going on, or you feel like, I can't control this, and it's just blowing my mind that I just cannot hang on. And you're trying to grip everything with the two hands you have. And God says, stop it. Trust that I've got it. Trust me that I've got it. Do what I've put before you to do and trust me to take care of everything. Even when you don't feel strong enough. Even when you don't feel like you can find all the right answers you need on the internet. Even when the doctor's not giving you all the answers you want. Even when the the the... the <laughs> even when the internet company is not giving you the answers you want to hear, even when you're not getting what you want, trust the Lord because he knows what he's doing because he knows better than we do. And there was a moment in Paul's life, Paul on this ship speaking this, but there was another moment that he spoke about to a group of Christians in Corinth. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul writes, to keep me from becoming conceited, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest on me. My grace is sufficient for you. My grace is enough. You don't need to be able to get rid of that thing. You don't need to be able to control the thing. My grace is enough for you. My grace should be enough for you. Trust in him. Trust in his grace. Trust in his strength. Because that's what faith is. Faith is trust. 
Trust of God for all things. Trust of God for everything. Faith is trust. In the original language, in the Greek, faith and trust are the exact same word. There's not two different words of the same. Faith is trust. If we're going to trust God, then we're going to live like it. We're going to demonstrate it in our faith and how we live and how we walk and how we act and how we speak in the decisions we make. Do we trust God? Do we have faith that God is going to do what he told us he's going to do? Never leave us or forsake us. Be with us to the end of the age. Provide for us. Answer our prayers. Comfort us, the great comforter. Walk with us as we stand firm, Ephesians chapter 6. Do we have faith in God? Do we have faith in the rock that we're supposed to be building on? It goes back to, to, to what Jesus said there on the cross in Luke 23, 46. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. I commit. That word commit is an important word. It means to entrust the care of oneself to someone else. To entrust the care of oneself to someone else. Father, into your hands I commit my, my what? My spirit. Now, if you're sitting there in those green pews or if you're watching at home, wherever you're sitting, I commit something. Into your hands, I commit. That means into your hands, I trust that you will take care of it. I trust that you will do with it as you see fit. I trust that you know better than I do. I trust your control more than mine. Father, into your hands, I commit. Consider that what comes next, a blank that you're going to fill in for yourself. Father, into your hands, I commit my health. Father, into your hands, I commit my finances. Father, into your hands, I commit my children. Father, into your hands, I commit my job. Father, into your hands, I commit my anxiety. Father, into your hands, I commit whatever it is that is bearing down on you that you cannot control, no, no matter how much you try. It is the storm that is blowing the ship of your mind all over the seas. And as much as you wrestle with it, as much as you try to grab the wheel and control where it's going, you can't. And it goes all over the place. And the Lord speaks to you. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Let me take it. Let me control it. So I know some of you, I can see it on your face, some, there's something you've been struggling with. Struggling with surrendering, struggling with giving over. And the, God is telling you right now through his word, through the words of Jesus, into your hands I commit my spirit. What is it that you need to commit to him? That you need to trust to his care. You need to trust that he knows best. What do you need to give over to him? What do you need to surrender that you're not willing or ready yet to surrender? It's the idea, you know what, um, my wife gave me this multi-tool for anniversary last year. It's great. Uh, and it's got pliers on it. Now, say I wanted to disassemble this table, all right? I put it together. So I, I know there's screws down here on the bottom. So I, I don't need the pliers. I need the, the Phillips head that's over here. And I got the Phillips head out. And I was going to take this apart. But it was too tight, and I couldn't undo it. And then Jesus comes along next to me and says, well, just hand me the screwdriver and I'll take care of it. Say, Jesus, I trust you. I trust you're going to take care of it, but I won't let him get there. I, I trust you, Jesus. I'll, I'll give it to you in a minute. I'm just going to keep. Jesus, Jesus, take care of the screw for me, Jesus. Jesus, come on, Jesus, you got it. And I, I won't let him take the screwdriver because I think I can do it myself. I say all day long, you got it, Jesus, but I won't give him the tool to do it. You've got to give it to him. Because Jesus can do it better than we can. Every single time, Jesus can do it better than we can. He knows better. He's stronger. I don't know if you knew that Jesus is stronger than you are. I don't know if you knew it either. He's smarter than you are. He's so smart, he created the brain. When's the last time you made a brain? And giving birth to a kid doesn't count. Jesus is pretty smart. He created everything, not just your brain, but your eyeballs and how they work. He created, think about, I mean, just the stuff you learned in elementary school, photosynthesis. 
We breathe out carbon dioxide. Plants take it in. Plants shoot out oxygen. We take it in. Who would have thought of that? Ears. The things we hear, how they function, how they operate. I mean, just think about all the stuff that, that your senses take in at even, any given moment. From what you see, what you hear, what you smell, what you taste, what you feel. And your brain is able to process all of it simultaneously while still allowing you to breathe and your heart to beat. Automatically, without thinking about it. That's a lot more RAM than any computer I've ever had. Sometimes it doesn't feel like enough, right? But God knows what he's doing. And so it comes down to the fact, do I trust that God? That God who created all that stuff? Do I trust that he knows what to do with my one life? When he was able to pull all of this off with just a word from his mouth. Do I trust him? Will I trust him? Will I commit to him the thing that I'm still holding on to with both hands, with a death grip? Will I trust him with that thing? And say, God, into your hands I commit. I commit my anxiety. God, into your hands I commit my desire to live up to expectations. God, into your hands I commit my children and their health and their well-being. God, I can do what I can do, but into your hands, I commit the outcome. God, I can't control it. Into your hands, I commit. I commit to you what the future of the world is going to look like. God, into your hands, I commit the politics. God, into your hands, I commit. And whatever it is that's occupying your mind and allowing you to be blown all over the sea, we need to commit to the Lord. I want you to stand and say, God, into your hands I commit it. God, I'm gonna, God, I know me. This is, this is me talking. And I know I'm going to try to wrestle control away from you sometimes. I don't want to. But I know me. And I know I've done it before. But this is how I want to be, God, from here on. I want to commit it to you. Trust that you have got it. And allow you to take it. From here on out. Whatever it may be. God, into your hands, I commit this thing and allow you to take it. Maybe today, the thing that you need to commit to the Lord is your life. You need to commit to him. You need to commit your life to him and say, I need God's presence. I need God's power. I need God's strength because the storm is overwhelming. And I've never believed in Jesus. I may have known about Jesus and heard about Jesus at Christmas time when Linus stands up on Charlie Brown and he talks about Jesus or at Easter when every once in a while someone will talk about Good Friday and why it's called Good Friday. Maybe, maybe I've heard about Jesus, but I've never actually believed in Jesus. Well, today is the day you need to make that decision. And don't put it off and don't argue and, and, and don't say, God, I'll do it another time. God, I'll do it when I think about it a little bit more. God, I need to understand a little bit more. Well, the truth of the matter is you're never going to understand everything. Your brain is finite. It's got a cap. And, and honestly, the cap seems to get lower a little bit every single day. But we need to trust that he knows what he's doing. So will you believe today that Jesus died, died what we saw there, gave up his spirit. He died so all your sins would be forgiven. Every single one. Even the ones you're going to do in five years, already forgiven. He died so all your sins would be forgiven, and then he rose from the dead so you can live after you die. Will you believe in Jesus today? Will you come to Jesus today and stop putting it off and stop delaying and stop ignoring the voice of the Spirit in your mind right now that's telling you, believe today? Stop trying to distract yourself and believe in Jesus today. Will you believe? Will you come to Jesus today? At the very end of, uh, of Scripture, last page of the book of Revelation, you know what it says? It's an invitation. Come. Come, all who are thirsty, come. Jesus says it, come. Will you today come to Jesus?